um, this is our third uh, uh, lectures of this series in the fall. Um, as you may know, today, um, September 22nd, marks the 41st anniversary of Iraq's invasion of, of Iran. And as you're uh, well aware, um, that war extended uh, um, almost eight years, to be exact, seven years, 10 months, four weeks, and one day. I'm emphasizing on that just to uh, tell you how, how hard it was for people, Iranians who were in Iran, and us who were outside Iran, because every time that a bomb dropped and uh, um, you know, imagine what we felt, especially those of us who had many relatives in Western and, and Southwestern Iran, uh, which was a, a big target. And then of course, uh, the war extended. Uh, so, and thanks to um, Dr. Farzone, Professor Farzone, for accepting our invitation, we started talking to him about a year ago. And uh, we were hoping that the uh, pandemic will allow us uh, to have this session in person, but unfortunately we were not able to. So uh, we thought maybe uh, have this uh, at least online and hopefully we could have uh, Professor Farzane at some other um, time, um, have him um, come to Duke University, UNC or NC State as uh, doing a and an in-person um, uh, lecture, or, or even in um, the uh, Iranian Cultural Center. Dr. Farzana is an associate professor of history at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago, where he teaches history of Iran and the Middle East. His first book, uh, The Iranian Constitutional Revolution and the Clerical Leadership of Khorasani, won the 2016 Best First Book Award of the National History Honor Society. His book, uh, Iranian Women and Gender in the Iran-Iraq War, has received great reviews so far and is being considered for several uh, book awards. According to a peer review, it is on track to become a classic in Iranian studies as it has pioneered the scholarship considers the significant role of Iranian women and gender in the uh, Iran-Iraq war. Besides teaching and writing books, Professor Farzane is also the principal of the Mossadegh scholarship named after the late Iranian Prime Minister, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. Northeastern Illinois University is also home to the Mossadegh Servant Leaders Hall uh, as the only academic space in the world named after the beloved premier. He is currently working to create the first ever Cyrus of Persia scholarship named after Cyrus the Great. It will provide a full scholarship for four years to a promising high school graduate in financial need. Tonight, Dr. Farzane will share with us his extensive research as to how Iranian women participated in the and challenged their gender role in opposition to the Islamic Republic's plan for women's future. Please help me to welcome Professor Farzana. Professor Farzana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, you. Mr. Imamian. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Kite. It's nice meeting everybody virtually from a couple of thousand miles away, I guess, in Chicago. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for your invitation and for the sponsorship of the uh, 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 this event uh, through the Iran House, as well as all the sponsors, um, including Duke University, uh, the Iranian uh, graduate students, 
uh, union. I'm sorry if I don't have the exact names. It's okay. That's okay. Uh, but I appreciate this opportunity. I have come and I've been to uh, Chapel Hill once uh, and I was greeted very warmly. So um, I would love to do it again in the near future, hopefully. And best of luck to you with the Iranian Cultural Center. It's such a noble thing to do. Uh, and it's about time that the, pretty much the Iranian diaspora, the Iranian Americans would have a center like that in every major city and every non-major city as well, if there is uh, uh, a population that would be uh, uh, supporting it. Uh, we at Northeastern also um, are after our own Iranian population and people in other places, and that's how we gathered the money that we needed for the Mossadegh initiative for the Mossadegh Hall. Uh, and it was an international effort. People from France and from the UK also contributed. Uh, so it wasn't just limited to, uh, to just the city of Chicago or Chicago land area. Uh, so where do we start with, with this book? Um, as you probably know, um, war in general, I'm, I'm going to try to do a non- uh, sort of academic talk to make it more accessible uh, to those of us who might not uh, uh, want to hear all the jargon. So I'm going to simplify as much as possible to understand the importance of the role of Iranian women in the Iran-Iraq war and in the process, uh, what they gain and uh, what they don't gain in, in the process of their involvement. Let's see. So there is a simple fact uh, that everybody needs to think about, that for every male who fought in the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 88, at least one and very likely two, three, or four females helped them fight. That's just a pure fact. The one woman would be the mother, right, of the soldier, and the sister, and the uh, uh, family, the extended family, grandmothers. If you uh, have anyone experiencing the wrath of war uh, uh, by having someone volunteer or be mandated or conscripted uh, in the regular standing army to participate in the war, then you know that uh, he went to the war and a whole army of people behind him fought a different kind of war at home with the stress, with the, with the waiting period, uh, with all the things that involves uh, sending your loved one to uh, a mission uh, that its future could be very, very bitter. And even when the person comes back, usually that has its own uh, uh, psychological, mental, uh, sociological uh, baggage with it. So wars usually don't end. Uh, the they firing of missiles and bullets and bombs may, uh, may finish at some point, but wars in general, because of their ramifications, the consequences of the war, they don't end. And uh, pretty much in world history, I'm a historian, so I always refer back to past uh, events in other areas other than Iran. Uh, in all the wars, we've had women involved. Uh, the Russians did it, the Europeans did it, the Americans have done it. The Asians have done it, South Asians, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Africans, uh, uh, people from Oceania, from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, in various capacities, they, they participate in wars. But uh, astonishingly, uh, our scholarship is less kind towards uh, understanding the participation of women. Why do they participate? How do they participate? And how do we evaluate uh, their involvement and contribution to war efforts? So, my aim pretty much for uh, writing this book uh, was mostly based on the understanding that I did not want to uh, allow the state uh, or the Islamic Republic in essence to create and have an exclusive right to narrate the history of the Iran-Iraq war. I hope I'm clear on that. Meaning that the narrative in Iran right now is a state narrative. The story is told from the perspective of the regime or the government. And uh, it has a very unique, a very one-sided perspective that is mostly ideological 
an extremely political based on uh, the survival of the regime and, and without getting too political on that, uh, it, it has a aim that it wants to meet. And at the same time, it leaves many, many things out and women are obviously uh, uh, one portion of that. So I wanted to address that shortcoming and kind of uh, uh, let the world know uh, by publishing this book that uh, it wasn't as simple as some might think it was that men went to war and they're the ones that self-sacrifice. Women, I argue, did uh, much more actually than men that appeared on the, on the war front simply because of the roles that they played. So in this presentation, um, we'll briefly discuss women and gender in Iran, generally speaking. We'll explain how uh, it challenges the war narrative, this book, uh, what sources I used and uh, provide research context for uh, uh, my actions. And uh, I will argue how it empowers women, the participation it empowers women by placing them in the historical context of the war. So meaning we bring women into the story and not leave them out as it has been the case. Uh, I think somebody's microphone might be on. So if I could kindly ask everybody to mute because it's, uh, it's uh, having feedback here. Uh, also, I will discuss uh, what's different about this book than other books uh, about women and war. By the way, this is the uh, first book ever written from a historical perspective about the involvement of Iranian women in the war. So uh, uh, it doesn't have a comparison. So we're kind of forced to compare it with other books that talk about women in the revolution or in the Islamic Republic and, and the role of gender. And uh, if we have time, then, then I'll read a passage um, and I'll, I'll, pr I'll, I'll promise not to cry reading that passage because it's a very sad passage uh, uh, in the book. So very quickly, uh, in understanding Iranian women in the pre-Islamic period or in the time of the Sasanian rule in Iran, uh, we don't have much sources that tell us about the involvement of women in conflict. Okay, so we don't know much about it. There is some, but it's very, very scarce. In the Islamic Caliphate period, basically we're talking about from year 640s to the time of the Mongolian invasion that takes place in 1258 that involves Iran as well. We have more sources about women that were involved in Islamic jurisprudence. And then when the uh, uh, Persians essentially stamped their identity by becoming Shiite from 1501 under the Safavids and then the Qajar period, uh, we don't see much in the Safavid period, but in the Qajar period, we see an increased role of women, Iranian women in politics, as well as uh, in uh, various fields of art, literature, so on and so forth. But still, it's, it's minimal. During the Pahlavi period, however, from 1924 to 1979, uh, many of you re remember that uh, Iran adopted a secular a state uh, Western feminist approach that um, was affected because it was class-based, meaning the opportunities that were provided for women depended on the class of women that would be allowed by the family to either participate or not in the greater scheme of the reforms that they first the Reza Shah and then uh, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi had in mind for, uh, uh, for the lack of a better term, liberating Iranian women to allow them to participate. So what I argue also in the book is that Iranian women have never had the freedom up until now, even they've never had the freedom to state what kind of feminism they wanted. This feminism or this movement was actually dictated from above from the state, and that's what we call, uh, or we mean by state feminism. In the Islamic Republic, things basically continue, but in a different light. And uh, this is the point that some might agree or disagree with, but still you have a native Islamic feminism uh, that is described based on what Islamist feminists or Islamist women want to believe 
that that's what women are supposed to do based on their understanding of their identity as Shiite women. In the Iran-Iraq war, however, uh, we have a, a incredible and unique opportunity that's uh, afforded to Iranian women of all backgrounds. This is the only time in Iranian history that actually women take the initiative without pressure from anyone to participate in a national crisis, which was the war from the minute, and we are uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, commemorating uh, or remembering the beginning of the war as uh, Mr. Imam Yan mentioned, the 41st uh, anniversary from the first hour, literally the first hour that the first uh, uh, efforts of Iraq uh, started to uh, invade Iran, women were involved in it. And up until now to this minute, Iranian women are still fighting a war that has stopped over 30 some odd years ago. I hope I'm not going too fast. If I am, please let me know. Some facts about the war. The Iran-Iraq war, as uh, uh, the Islamic Republic calls it, the holy defense or the sacred defense, the Fai Mogadas, or uh, it has another name, the imposed war or the Jangit Tahmili, was the longest conventional war of the 20th century. Many people don't know that. It allowed for the solidification of the newly established Islamic Republic. Many people don't think about that, but it's true. Uh, officially, uh, I argue in the book that we have 837,918 women that actually participated. And how do we get this number? The number is a calculation based on the men that were actually killed, captured, injured or have gone MIA. And then on the uh, left side, I have the number of women that actually were killed, injured, or served as uh, prisoners of war or POWs, or are uh, uh, still waiting for the men to return. Um, the numbers that uh, are disputed because of uh, scarcity of sources, again, uh, due to political wrangling within the establishment in Iran, uh, officially, we have the number of Iranian women POWs at 41, uh, but in essence, another source has said there were over 170 women that served a period of time in Iraqi prisons as prisoners of war. Iran, uh, this number, the 11,697, uh, might have gone down by probably a dozen or half a dozen, simply because more and more bodies or remains are actually found and uh, uh, it lessens from the number of the missing in action or the MIA in Iran. So uh, at the very basis of our argument is that why don't we talk about the 837,000 women that actually participated in the war? And, and participating in war doesn't mean that you actually picked up a gun and went to war, but it also does include the, uh, um, the husband that no longer will be providing a living for the family. It means the brother, the son uh, that uh, uh, will not be at home and hence all the responsibilities in this patriarchal, highly patriarchal society is basically given to uh, uh, women to take care of. So as I said, the official war narrative in Iran is very, very uh, uh, male-centered, okay? So it portrays it as an all male endeavor. Uh, the narrative says that uh, it suggests that men sacrificed everything and kind of leaves women out of it. It indicates that it was the men that actually, actually protected uh, Iran's Amin, uh, uh, Mihan or Vatan, whatever you want to call it. It also claims that women's role was only to reproduce their children and raise children, brave sons that is, to dedicate to the war. So they, they had a reproductive uh, 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 sort of responsibility based on this interpretation that I argue against. And then it states that women took care of family while men fought, which is true, but at the same time, women did also fight in the war and they did participate in a variety of roles, 
in the book, I argued that there were over 17 or 18 roles that actually women played in. Uh, one stark uh, uh, sort of uh, reality about the war is that out of the 20,000 plus articles that were written about the war, only 93 of them, only 93, that's 0.004% uh, of the articles uh, actually mention women. So in comparison with the number that I had in the previous slide, this basically is pretty much ignoring the participation of women altogether. And uh, by the way, um, for those of you who might be curious about this photo, this photo, I took this photo when I visited uh, the uh, Jame Mosque, which uh, is synonymous with the sacred defense in the city of Khoramshahr, as the city fell to the Iraqi forces for 18 months, 19 months, and uh, um, Iran took heavy casualties in order to keep the city uh, from falling into the hands of the Iraqis. But, and some of the first actually martyred uh, or the people killed were actually women. So when I went to the, to the mosque uh, uh, to start my research back in 2009, I noticed that the wall uh, had no picture of any woman whatsoever. And again, that was probably one of the trigger points uh, uh, to kind of question why is it that we don't want to talk about the women that actually sacrificed their life too for the war and we just focus on men. One of the things that the reviews are talking about that uh, uh, highlight the positive aspect of the book, and this is the reviewers talking, not me, is that uh, uh, the book uses memoirs that were written by women about their participation. Uh, these are the sources that usually people from the West or people even inside Iran don't read because they equate the organizations that actually put out these sources as arms of the state and arms of oppression, uh, which from a historical perspective, uh, I kind of put aside for a moment. So. Uh, to put it in a, in a different light, I kind of put my personal uh, beliefs, my political beliefs, uh, uh, what I would want for Iran to happen and how I envision the future of Iran. I put that aside momentarily. I put my anger aside. And that's what doesn't get done when we study Iran in many, many aspects. We take our personal grievances and we make it a scholarship a grievance, an academic grievance, which I think is incorrect and doesn't give you the answer. So what I did, which nobody had done, is I went to the sources of women that actually were involved in the war, and I wanted to hear it from them as to what it was, the reasons that they actually participated in the war. And that's how uh, uh, um, the book that ended up being almost 800 pages, we had to reduce a considerable number of pages down to 400 pages in order to uh, really get the cream of the crop of the argument that actually women put out about their involvement. And we can talk about that in the Q&A uh, segment. Uh, I also use private uh, uh, collections of photos that hadn't been seen before from uh, photographers and people that actually took the photos for themselves, people that were actually involved in the war. I got my hands on some documents that were not part of the official documents. So these are from volunteer centers, uh, such as forms, uh, uh, ledgers, and what have you identification cards uh, with names of women and uh, um, pictures of women on them, uh, audio video recordings of women that were interviewed about their participation in the war, and also Red Cross records. Again, all of these sources, it didn't take uh, a huge effort for me to go ask the government to, to hand over records because they don't usually to people that show up from, the, uh, from Western institutions. So basically all of these were available either in normal bookstores in Tehran and in other places, or you just had to connect with the right people that the publishers would basically introduce me to, and they would be more than happy to share these things. However, the challenge, I say it in the book, the challenge of doing research in Iran is like playing Russian roulette. Uh, uh, you don't know what's gonna happen because somebody that might not like how you might be contextualizing re your research uh, would make trouble for you. And, and uh, that happens actually more often than not. Uh, this is the list of the things that I actually talk in the book. This is the table of contents that I thought I'd share with you. 
So uh, uh, if you uh, uh, get the book or if you get the book for your library, which I highly recommend, uh, uh, is that I uh, discuss the various roles of women starting from chapter three. So I treat the women of Khoram Shah and Abadan differently because they're at the war front from day one of the war when the war starts on the 22nd of September, 1980. I talk about women of the state. These women either work for the Revolutionary Guards or for the Basij Mobilization Forces or for Red Cross or for Wizarat uh, al um, uh, or, or the Ministry of Health. So they would be doctors, surgeons, nurses, and what have you. And uh, then I talk about home front sacrifices. Uh, these are the women that created the um, soup kitchens, as we call them, that pretty much supported all the war, war front for the eight years that the war was going on. Without their help, it would have been a whole lot more difficult to, to go on for eight years. So their role of women in that capacity is extremely important. I talk about uh, uh, women, especially in Kurdistan and in Elam, uh, that they fight against the Iraqis, so they become war combatants. Uh, uh, there is this woman in the village of uh, Awzin in, uh, um, I think it's in, uh, outside of Kermanshah, uh, between Kermanshah and Ghazwi Shirin, where she actually hacks to death an Iraqi uh, soldier that has invaded her village. So I talk about those women that uh, uh, nobody has ever heard of. Uh, I talk about female prisoners of war. Uh, there are uh, few books about that, and these stories are just horrific. And I try to capture uh, pretty much the gist of their experience and the reasons for their involvement. And then uh, I talk about what happens when men leave. They either don't come back, they go missing, or uh, uh, they become POWs, and what happens to those women? That's still participation in the war. I consider that a big part of the war uh, contribution because these women are basically left to their own designs, and I have different uh, 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 cross-section samples of women that actually uh, are discussed in this chapter to paint a picture, a better picture of their involvement. And then the last two chapters are basically uh, uh, the context that, okay, so what you participated, 837,000 of you participated, what did women get out of it? And it's in this section that I argue that uh, there are two things that actually happen. One, uh, women get the kind of confidence that they usually wouldn't have gotten if this war hadn't happened, if they hadn't uh, participated. Because remember, the women that actually participated in the war by majority, by majority, the women that actually participated in the war were from lower class, lower socioeconomic background. They were ethnic. They spoke a second language other than Persian, so either Kurdish or Lori or, or Azeri or Arabic, which is extremely important. And also they came from highly conservative backgrounds. So I discussed throughout the book, why is it that a young woman who's 17 or 16 or 18, that during the Pahlavi period was not allowed to even watch TV or was not allowed to go to various camps in Ramsar. And those of you who are old enough remember uh, 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 what the Ramsar camp was all about, that they invited uh, top students from across the nation to participate in the summer camps. A lot of these women were not allowed to participate. So why is it that when the war happens, all of a sudden, the same woman, the same girl that's not allowed to participate in any activity that has stranger males in it, all of a the sudden, they're allowed to carry guns and hang out in the war bunkers and hang out with a bunch of men that they don't know. So I, I question that, and, and I have some answers in it uh, uh, that basically says, it's the, it's the devotion to not only their country, not only to their city or village, but also to Islam from their perspective. And there is no uh, 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 room for arguing why do they believe in that, uh, in that model or not. That's what they choose to do. And, and I kind of respect that and put everything that they want to say in the context of their argument. And I don't add anything to it to, to muddy the water, so to speak, of their argument. 
and uh, pretty much uh, the, the appendices uh, that I provide, uh, I have a list of cities that were bombarded, uh, also the articles about women's participation, I list them, the 93 articles that I list, and uh, uh, in Appendix C, I uh, provide the names of the over 200 women that actually I discuss in my book. So in case you want to see who's who, you can basically go to that appendix and, and use their uh, name or uh, look for their name and then uh, follow them in the book. Uh, let's see. And I think that's about it. I'm going to stop.